Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with Chocolate Yule Log. That's right, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say many home cooks would not attempt something like this because they assume it involves many components, lots of steps, and super advanced culinary skills to make. Well, I'm very happy to tell you that only two out of those three things are true. Because while this does require a little bit of time and effort, the techniques involved in making this Bush de Noel are actually quite simple especially if you have a video that shows you how to do them. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our filling. And by filling, I mean very simple buttercream frosting. And for that, we're gonna combine some powdered sugar with a little bit of butter, as well as a touch of cocoa powder, which is high quality and unsweetened, by the way. Then we'll also add a pinch of salt, as well as a splash of coffee liqueur and or extract. And what we'll do is take that over to our mixer and whip it up until it's very light and fluffy. And if your butter's nice and soft, this is gonna happen very quickly and easily. But if it's still kind of firm and cold like mine, it's not. It's gonna stick in the middle of the whisk and really do nothing. And you'll have to stop and work it with your spatula and do that a few times until it starts to soften up, which I won't make you watch. But either way, we're gonna whip that on high speed until like I said, it's very, very light and fluffy. And hopefully it looks a little something like this. And while we could certainly use this as is, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this into a bowl and add one more ingredient, a nice big spoon of mascarpone cheese, which is a wonderfully rich Italian style cream cheese. And we'll go ahead and use our spatula to mix that in. And that's gonna add a really nice little bit of tanginess in the background, as well as sort of lighten this up a little. And by the way, you know your frosting is pretty decadent when you're lightening it up with mascarpone. But anyway, we'll go ahead and stir that in and then simply set that aside until we need it. At which point we'll move on to one more thing we need to do ahead of time. And that would be to line a baking sheet with some parchment paper and brush it generously with melted butter. And I didn't show it, but a little tip, put a little butter on the pan before you put the paper down, which will sort of hold it in place while you brush it. And then once our pan is prepped, we can move on to this very simple chocolate sponge cake recipe, which we will start by combining our dry ingredients, which includes cocoa powder, some salt, and just a little bit of all-purpose flour. And what we'll do is go ahead and take a whisk and give that a good mix even though technically we really should sift this. Okay, and the reason is sometimes you get little clumps or lumps of cocoa that you really wanna have broken up before you add it to the wet stuff. And while whisking this together for a minute generally does break those up, I would say sifting does do a better job. But either way, once that's been accomplished, we can move on to our wet ingredients, which are exactly five large eggs that are room temperature. Very important, you do not use cold eggs for this. And then to the eggs, we'll add a little touch of sugar, and what we're gonna do here is whip these on high speed for a few minutes until they turn very, very pale, very thick, and very fluffy. Which is why, if possible, you really do wanna use an electric mixer for this. I mean, sure, you can do it by hand, but it's gonna take a long time and a lot of effort. Although the good news is you'll probably burn more calories than the average serving of cake. But either way, we're gonna whip those eggs and sugar until they get really thick and fluffy and look exactly like this. All right, you see that? Do not stop before it looks like this. And then what we'll do at this point is add our dry ingredients in two additions. Okay, we'll transfer in about half. In this first addition, we're just gonna mix for a few seconds, All right? not on high speed, on one of your lower settings, just until it starts to mix in. Oh, and if you're gonna forget to put in your vanilla extract, this would be the point you would forget to do that. So yes, I should have added that here, and I'll mention that in the blog post. But anyway, as I was saying, we're gonna mix that first half in for a few seconds. And even though it's not totally mixed in, we're gonna stop and add the rest. And then we'll start that on low for a few seconds before turning it up to a higher speed for a few more seconds. At which point we're gonna stop and it's still not all mixed in. But again, that's not a problem because we're gonna finish this by hand. Okay, just pull off that whisk and give that a few stirs manually and then give it a check. And it was close, but I decided to give it a few more stirs. And this way we can make sure we're incorporating everything around the edges and along the bottom without knocking out too much of that foaminess which could possibly happen if we mix this all the way with the machine. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto our baking sheet. And we'll use a spatula to spread that out as even as we can. And please note, I'm not going all the way out to the edges. And you can if you want, it's not really a problem, but I actually prefer to leave a little space on either end. And while those edges will be a little thinner once it bakes, I think that works out in our favor later on. But bottom line, we'll go ahead and transfer our batter on and spread it out. At which point we have to give this thing the old tappa tappa. 
Because while we do want all the millions and millions of little bubbles in there, we want to knock out the few hundred big bubbles. So we'll go ahead and bang that on the table a few times before we transfer into the center of a 400 degree oven for just eight to 10 minutes or until it looks like what you're gonna see in a few seconds. And while that's baking, we're gonna have just enough time to take a clean kitchen towel and cover it with a nice dusting of powdered sugar. And you don't have to do the whole thing, just an area slightly bigger than a sheet pan. And you're gonna see why in just a minute. And we'll go ahead and pull out our cake, which after about eight to 10 minutes should look like this. And what we'll wanna do is let this cool down for a couple minutes while we do a few things. One would be to go around with a knife, making sure it's not stuck to the pan. And if it is, just cut it loose. And the other would be to dust the top of this with a little bit of powdered sugar. And what the powdered sugar is doing on the cake and the towel is preventing this very sticky sponge from sticking. And by the way, you can if you want use cocoa, but that's more expensive than powdered sugar. So I'm going with this. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and give this one last check with a spatula to make sure it's not sticking anywhere. Because the next step is to flop this over onto our towel, which is my preferred method. Right, some people like to cover it with a towel and then flip it over. But as long as you have this lined up and you do it quick, it's going to be fine. And then we'll remove the pan and carefully peel off our parchment paper. And hopefully none of it sticks. Even though almost always a little bit does. But that's fine because you get to scrape that off with your fingernail and eat it. And get a little sneak preview. And then before we roll this up in our towel, we want to give it one more dusting of powdered sugar. Because I can't stress enough how much this stuff loves to stick to anything. Plastic, metal, wood, even a towel. So we'll go ahead and dust that again. And then very carefully, very gently roll this up. And because this is such a delicate sponge, we don't want to be pressing down as we do this. Okay, so use a very light touch. And we'll go ahead and roll that all the way. And then all we're going to do is let this cool down rolled up like this for 15 minutes. And by doing this, the sponge is going to have the memory of this roll so that when we unroll it and spread our filling on, we can roll it back up without it cracking. So this is a very key step. And as you can see, some of the sugar actually stuck to the towel, but none of the cake did. So mission accomplished. And at this point, we can go ahead and transfer on our filling and spread it out evenly. And to make that a little easier, what we like to do is dollop our filling here and there so that it's equally distributed before we start spreading it around. Okay, versus dumping it all in one spot and then trying to spread it all out evenly. And by the way, I thought I was being really judicious with the buttercream here, but as it turned out, I put on a lot more than I realized, as you'll see in the final shots, which is great if you're one of these frosting people, but I'm more of a cake guy. Anyway, the point is you spread on as much as you want. I mean, you are after all the me of this edible tree. So we will leave this cake to frosting ratio up to you. And then once we have that all spread out, we can go ahead and carefully start to roll this up. And the first few inches are the hardest. And if you need to use the towel to kind of help you along, go ahead. But once you get it started, you should be fine. And because our sponge has that quote unquote memory of being rolled, you shouldn't really have a problem with it cracking. And just like the first time we rolled it, don't press down too hard. Okay, use a nice light touch. And once we're happy with how that's rolled and shaped, We'll go ahead and dust the top with a little more sugar, because why not? And then once that's dusted, we'll go ahead and wrap it in plastic. And please accept my apologies for speeding this up, which I hate to do. But I didn't have enough interesting things to say to fill up the time. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and wrap that in plastic. And I'm doing two layers, even though I'm only showing one. And once wrapped, we're going to transfer that into the fridge for a few hours or until it's completely chilled before we apply our bark. So we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge. And while it's in there, I'm going to go ahead and make my chocolate ganache, which is nothing more than dark chocolate chips with hot boiling cream poured over it. And we'll let that sit like that for about a minute before stirring it together. And as usual with chocolate ganache, it looks terrible. But then you keep stirring, and eventually it looks awesome. And as that cools, it's going to thicken up. As you can see right here with a little bit I had left over from a different batch. And to me, that makes one of the great chocolate frostings of all time. And as you're about to see, makes a very beautiful bark. And then, assuming our chocolate Yule log is completely chilled, we'll go ahead and pull that out and unwrap it. And we'll cut a little piece off the end, officially to kind of clean it up, but unofficially because I wanted to taste it. And it was amazing. And by the way, I didn't like what that serrated edge was doing, so I switched to a straight edge knife. 
And what we want to do is make an angled cut about three inches or so from the end. Because what's going to happen once we transfer the main log to a parchment lined sheet pan is that we're going to apply a little bit of buttercream to that cut piece and sort of stick or press that onto the side to make it look like there's another branch coming off our log. And while this step's optional, I think it really does make for a much more impressive presentation. And then once that was set, I took the rest of my leftover ganache and used that to cover where that branch attached. And as far as working with the ganache, you can let it get really stiff like this. And as long as it's still spreadable, it's fine. But as you can see, as I continue covering this with the fresh ganache, I find this looser, runnier stuff a little easier to work with. All right, as long as it's not too runny. Okay, we don't want this running all over our pan. But either way, we're going to go ahead and apply a nice layer of our ganache over the entire log, all right, all the way down to the bottom. But of course, we will leave the front and side uncovered so we can see our beautiful swirl. And people can see that our log is roughly five to six years old. And just by spreading the ganache over like this, you're going to get a fairly bark-like appearance. But for our final bark details, what we want to do is pop this in the fridge for about 15 or 20 minutes until that stuff firms up a little bit. And then using the tip of the knife, we can really give this thing the texture of actual bark. Okay, just drag that tip through all over. And since real bark is kind of rough and irregular, there's really no way to screw this up. But personally, I think the rougher and more irregular, the better. And yes, this is exactly as fun as it looks, which is super fun. And then once we have those final details done, what we have to do again is chill this thoroughly before serving. So we'll pop that back into the fridge until we're ready to serve, at which point we'll transfer that onto some kind of attractive serving platter or a gorgeous piece of marble and proceed to dust the top a little bit of cocoa as well as a little powdered sugar to make it look even more like an old log that has a little bit of frost. And while your guests will be very, very impressed if you serve it just like this, if you wanted to, you could also add some gingerbread dirt as well as some meringue mushrooms which are super easy to make. And maybe I'll show you how to do those. And for a final touch, maybe we'll add a few rosemary sprigs here and there to complete the scene. And that's it, our chocolate Yule log is done. And it totally looks like we knew what we were doing. I mean, if this doesn't impress your friends and family, I'm sorry, but your friends and family are too hard to impress. But just looking amazing is not enough. This also should taste incredible. So I went ahead and cut a slice to try it out. And I play that up next to some meringue mushrooms, which are never not adorable. And despite it having a little too much buttercream for my taste, it really was fantastic. All right, that almost flourless chocolate sponge is just sweet enough and still very moist and paired perfectly with that very simple mocha buttercream. So above and beyond its show-stopping appearance, I really did enjoy the taste and texture of this as well. Oh, and I should mention, before this gets rolled up, you can actually soak the sponge with a little bit of liqueur or liquor, just like I'm doing here with some Kahlua. So if you did want to adult this up, you can brush or drizzle that onto the sponge itself, or just add some on when you slice it and serve it like this. So just a little bonus tip for how to help achieve those rosy Santa Claus-like cheeks. But anyway, I'll finish the rest of this slice off later. Right now I have to take a little mushroom break. Make that a mushrooms break. But anyway, that's it. My method for making the classic holiday bush de Noel. Like I said in the intro, not really that hard to make, although it does take a fair amount of time and effort. But when you're done, it looks like it takes a lot of time and effort, which really is the point of a special holiday dessert. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.